Hey everyone, welcome to week 34. This is day f five. <laughs> this is the last day of our ongoing uh, shadow and light week. We've painted Danny, we painted Fed, you know, with a nice kind of stream of sunshine coming in. We painted my niece. You know, I did a terrible job and I think it looks like my future niece. <laughs> I'm heavy handed, it's not my fault. Um, yesterday we painted my foot and uh, today we'll see how we round up this week. Remember, the focus was to hone in on the aspect of shadow, to try and prioritize shadow over light. That doesn't mean that we're gonna do dark paintings, it just means that we're paying a little more attention to what we're doing in the shadow side of our painting. So we'll see how we do today. Remember next week, new theme. I don't know what it's gonna be, but new theme. <laughs> so we'll see you guys next week. Bye, improvise. Okay, let's get started. Uh, today is our last day on our shadow and light week. And I think we've had a really productive week. I think it was kind of unexpected for me, the things that I've come to realize about my painting and about my own personality throughout the week. Because to be completely honest, when I do themed weeks, when we come up with a theme to do for every single week, I always try not to anticipate what I'm going to do with my paintings. Like I try not to imagine what every single painting is going to look like. Ideally, the nature of what we're doing, the nature of this project and these exercises is that I don't really try to have everything kind of set in stone. And what I try to do is I pay a ton of attention. I'm really, really conscious about what I do every single day with every single painting. And I hope that after every single painting session, I can reflect upon the things that went wrong, the things that were right, things that I didn't expect to encounter, things that eventually can make me grow as a painter and understand myself a little bit better. And based upon those very things, I say, okay, now that I know that this happened today, let me see how I can encounter tomorrow's painting. And that's probably the best scenario in painting because if we are not open to those things that are happening while we're painting, what is going to eventually happen is that we repeat ourselves and we impose ourselves onto a painting. Now, I'm not perfect. I probably reiterate a ton of things that I'm uh, very sensitive to. We're all human beings here. But I try to be conscious about those things. I try to acknowledge that I am perhaps uh, inclining a little bit towards those things that are my favorite things to paint. And when I catch myself doing that, I always tell myself, okay, come on, take a step back. Now, I'm, I'm saying this as I painted my, <laughs> my right foot yesterday, and I was clearly, clearly acknowledging my Menzel influence. And I don't know, quote unquote, unfortunately, I think that influence goes beyond that single painting. It's actually a way of seeing things. I think that that is the bigger influence. I mean, it's an influence that uh, lands on a painting of a foot, but I think the gaze, that's the one that has this power over me. And that's the one that it reminds me always of just turning my sensibility towards the smaller parts of this world and towards those minuscule, almost invisible moments that we can take for granted. And not just seeing painting as this grand thing. I always feel that it's not my job, but that I'd like to believe that I can balance out certain aspects in my own painting, of my own inclinations in painting, where when I always go to museums or exhibitions or all these places that have these amazing paintings by insanely talented painters and that throughout history have validated painting, I always find those places overwhelming and I find those paintings overwhelming. Whenever I see those huge paintings or those huge endeavors, I always tell myself, yeah, there's a precipice between me as a painter and that painter that's in the museum. And it probably speaks the truth. I mean, those painters are extraordinary. They are literally out of the ordinary. Upon millions of people that devote their life to painting, those are the best of those people. And whenever you put yourself against those people, you just feel deflated. You feel like there's no place, there's no room for you as a painter because that is what painting is supposed to be. Looking back upon yesterday when I decided to paint my right foot, it is almost like, yeah, it's an obvious homage to one of my favorite painters and one of my top five paintings of all time. But it's also, like I said, it's also about seeking balance. It's also about reclaiming painting in a weird way. 
because this is a painting that has been done by you know, one of the most incredible painters in history, which I'm not, <laughs> I'm clearly not. And it is just me saying, yeah, I am going to devote my life and I am going to devote my sensibility towards not trying to be one of these extraordinary painters because I know I'm not going to be. I think being honest with yourself is the first step. My first step, it's very easily just saying, yeah, I'm not going to be one of those people. I'm not going to be in one of these museums. So yeah, once we take that off the list, now it's like smooth sailing and you're like, yeah, I can actually do my life now because I have no expectations of being that good because I know I'm not that good. So I don't have to live my life just working my butt off to try to be that good. No, no. I think that those people are special. Very, very special. Me, I didn't have anywhere near the talent that a lot of people that are naturally talented that I've met throughout the years have. But I always thought, well, that's not a hindrance. That's never going to stop me. I just have to work hard. And that's about it. Yesterday's painting was just in, in many ways empowering and saying, yeah, you know, I can paint this subject matter. I can try and make it my own, even if it will never come close to, uh, to being that good. But it's a reminder that I can look into the smaller places. I can look into the little nooks and see what can I find here and why would it be my own? Why would it reflect on my life and my experiences? Because in the end, that is my foot. His foot was actually a lot cooler. It was a cooler model. I mean, if we were in a foot pageant, I'm sure he would have won. You know, I wouldn't have made top 10. So his foot was a lot cooler to start with, but my foot is my own, you know? That's all I have to work with, so <laughs> might as well make the best of it. For today's painting, um, I wanted to paint my friend Tim. I've, I've spoken about Tim Wilson. I love him as a human being. I think he is a terrific person, enormous heart. I am floored by his attitude towards painting. I think the way he encounters nature, I think the way he experiences nature, I think the way he literally puts himself out there and paints, it's just so raw, just so incredibly touching and beautiful that he is one of my favorite painters. He's one of my favorite people, one of my favorite painters. I can't say enough good things about his work, about his paintings. So I have this uh, picture of him that I had saved, and I was like, I'm going to paint Tim. And he's um, a tonalist painter. He is completely enamored by tonalist painting. So I was like, yeah, let's not do that. <laughs> let's not paint Tim in a way in which he would paint himself. Let's do this uh, natural sunlight painting where I'm trying to be somewhat sensitive to those colors, that saturation. But I'm going to try to be a little more heavy-handed just to be true to a little bit of what he is. And I think today's painting, and particularly if we're focusing in on the shadows, was a reminder of something that's absolutely beautiful about shadows. And it's the shadow mass. It's the massing of shadows. And what that means, you know, ideally, is that because shadows don't have the responsibility to describe form. Now, we've spoken about how if there's enough information kind of flooding in and feeding into that shadow, yes, we are very much so going to be aware of the form that is kind of residing inside that shadow, let's call it that. So yes, there's obviously conditions where a shadow can speak about form. That's obviously true. But we've also seen how shadow doesn't have the responsibility. It doesn't bear the responsibility to describe form. That falls on the shoulders of light. This is not my opinion. This is just like objectively true. That's just how our eyesight works. That's just how our brain is wired and how we visually experience nature. And that's how we understand one of those properties of light. So light has that responsibility. So shadow can almost remain as this anonymous mass. And the cool thing is that all shadows, regardless of the form that they belong to, they are shadows. They first are shadows. So the cool thing about shadows is that, for example, if we squint, all those shadows that belong to all these different forms can actually come together and say, yeah, we are one. We are all one big shadow. We are one big shadow mass. And that is one of the coolest things about massing in shadow. That is very obvious if we think of painters like, let's say, Alex Kanevsky, or if we think of painters like Phil Hale, particularly when Alex is doing like one of those um, darker paintings that are complete throwbacks to um, Hendrik bathing in the uh, river, by the way. But if, if Alex is doing one of those wonderful paintings, 
or if Phil Hale is doing one of his uh, paintings that are shot at night with those really long, deep shadows. I mean, both of them find a way to say, yeah, the shadow in form is going to quickly become this very atmospheric shadow. So there's not going to be a real difference, tonally at least, between a shadow that is projected, a shadow that is created when the form is moving away from light, and the dark atmosphere that surrounds the figure. Those are all going to be almost like one and they, they kind of blend with each other. They feel like this one soupy atmosphere where there's no limits. There doesn't have to be any boundaries there. And that's one of the coolest, coolest things about shadow. Now, if we slowly, slowly move from that very dark atmosphere towards something that's a little bit lighter, we can think of someone like Mark Tennant, for example, where he has, you know, that mass that is acting as a shadow mass, but it's surrounded by an atmosphere that's a little bit lighter, a little bit grayer. So the value that makes up the shadow mass can be actually very close to the value and the same hue sometimes as the background, as the surrounding atmosphere. So what do you do there? You just kind of let it flow into the atmosphere. It's that very Sargent thing where he would say that you have to bring some of your background into your shadow mass. Uh, whatever that color, temperature, hue that you have in your background, bring some of that into your shadow mass. If you just pay attention to that single little phrase and look at every single Sargent painting, you're gonna start saying, oh my God, it's always there. This is something that he always did. You know, he was always conscious about his backgrounds and how to bring those backgrounds into his shadow mass. They were always very analogous. So that's the way, in terms of color, that you can assure that a painting feels like it belongs to a place, like it, it's actually occupying and inhabiting a very specific space with a very specific light source. So that's something that he would do constantly in his paintings. And if you look for it, you're going to see it all the time. Now that we've mentioned um, Sargent, even though my painting of Tim cannot be farther from Sargent because for the life of me, I can't paint like Sargent. I mean, nobody can paint like Sargent. But anyways, I am reminded of, and perhaps this is because I lived in New York. Perhaps this is because I absolutely loved the paintings in the American collection at the Met. I would look at those paintings like crazy, those mid to late 19th century and early 20th century paintings. I just absolutely adored those paintings. And I could even say that I think it's, you know, out of all the paintings that I've ever seen of Sargent, it's maybe my favorite Sargent painting. Maybe. I mean, like I said, I'm a little bit biased because that museum, the Met, I still consider it like my museum. I know that museum by heart. This painting, I just loved every single time, every single time. And it's the Hermit painting. It's a very, very strange Sargent painting. It's a very loose, almost like European impressionistic painting. It's almost like he met Monet and, you know, Monet resonated in his head. And this is one of those looser Sargent paintings because Sargent could be quite loose, but in a very different fashion. I mean, he wasn't just European. He obviously has connections with Europe, but Sargent had so much going on in his paintings that he feels very different from that European tradition of impressionistic painting. So this is very brushy. This is very segmented. A ton of singular decisions in this painting, very broken um, but it's perfect. It's a perfect painting because what he's trying to convey is the simple idea of this human being being one with nature. This old hermit is part of nature. There's no difference between all these rocks and this foliage and these trees and the uh, deer that are surrounding him. They're all the same. All of the life that is depicted in this painting is one. So it's a very, very beautiful painting. If you think about it, it is a perfect execution, I feel, of a perfect concept. And that's why I feel that this is Sargent going beyond his just insanely masterful ability because he has an ability like no other painter, nobody else in painting history, that's as good as you can paint. Sargent was as good as you could ever paint. And his examples of painting are going to be for future generations that discover his work, they are going to realize that he was one of the most sublime examples of painting. We are probably blessed to have 450 years between us and Velázquez or Rembrandt. And we can say for a fact, yeah, those are some of the most amazing painters that ever lived. 
But maybe in another 300 years, when people have that same distance between themselves and Sargent and Soroja and Zorn and Ramon Casas and Fortuny, they can look back and say, wow, these were some of the most incredible painters in painting history. And they can equate them. They'll be far enough than they can say, in the same breath, they can say Velázquez, Sargent, Rembrandt, Zorn, and it'll feel the same. They will have the same weight because they are that good. They are that essential for painting. So that painting to me is a reminder of what shadow, even though it may be beautifully open and it may reflect all the nature that surrounds that light and it may be full of gorgeous information it may be full with so much information that it feels like it's almost like noise because that hermit painting of Sargent is very hard to digest you know at the beginning and once you kind of settle into the painting it's almost like once you realize that oh my god there's a deer there oh my god there's another deer there oh my god there's a guy there it's almost like this organic camouflage in painting that like i said makes absolute sense with what sargent was trying to convey i think i think that that's one of his most intelligent sensitive paintings ever so i adore the painting so what we did in this painting of tim which is very very different and ugh, i actually hate myself for mentioning sargent and then even looking at my own painting because I don't know. Every time, every time I would go to a sergeant show or just like a big show. I remember just a couple of years ago, maybe six years ago, that I went to a Zorn show that they had in New York that had some of his paintings and a lot of his watercolors. And come on. At first, it's just excitement, like your heart just wants to leap out of your body when you're looking at these Zorn watercolors. And you feel like the luckiest person on earth just because you have the chance to look at all these works, you know, in one place. And you can't breathe, you know, it's overwhelming. It's, there's so much talent in that room, so much knowledge, even in the tiniest paintings, that oof, you feel blessed. You feel like this is what's amazing about this world. This is what, you know, human beings are capable of doing. Like, ah, my God, the world can be a beautiful place. And then you step out and you go like, I'm so charged with energy. I'm so, so psyched. I'm so pumped. I want to go back to painting. And then you sit down or you stand in front of your easel and you start to paint and just reality just punches you in the face. Like with, you know, Hulk hands. You realize how far, how ridiculously far you are from painting like those people painted. And then you're just depressed for like a year and a half. That's why we have to go to good shows every year and a half because we need that year and a half to recover. Me, I need like an IV and just put the TV on and I'll just hibernate for like a year and a half. Ugh, God bless those painters, but also F them. They make us so happy and then they make us feel like nothing in like a second. In that same second, they have the ability to give us life and then to squash us. <laughs> so that was, uh, that was a Zorn exhibition for me. So I now feel totally ridiculous just by mentioning Sergeant and Zorn. And then I'm looking at my Tim painting that Tim, I'm trying to do my best. Like this is as good as I can paint. <laughs> so I was trying to be very loose, very expressionistic, having those shadow areas super open so that there are no boundaries between Tim's contour, like his forehead and the tree that's behind. All of that nature and Tim are one, which I think that Tim is that hermit from Sargent's paintings. Just, just give him like two years. I mean, he looks good. That guy is insanely good looking, but you know, give him two years. Oh, he can turn into that hermit. I mean, Maine can be really hard on you. So I don't know. But <laughs> anyways, that was my attempt for today. Just opening up shadow and reminding myself that shadows are also very beautiful because they don't discriminate. They can flow from one object to the other, to atmosphere, to another object, and they don't need permission, they don't need boundaries, they don't need limits or frontiers. No, we would never build a wall between <laughs> shadows. It makes no sense. Uh, and that's a beautiful democratic reminder <laughs> of shadows, of the massing of shadows. So I hope you guys enjoyed this week. It was super fun for me. Like I said, my intent was to learn about shadows. And as I was painting and as I was learning things about myself, 
things kind of get distorted, and I'm sorry, you know, maybe some of you guys say, well, you had a theme and it derailed. Yeah, that's the story of my life. That's never going to change. I apologize. That was even me as a teacher for 12 years at the uh, visual arts faculty at the university. I I go on tangents because I don't know. I lack structure. So (laughs) I apologize for that. But the purpose of all of this is that you guys can accompany me in a journey. And my journeys are not all straight. And I don't know everything. And sometimes I'm going to doubt myself. And sometimes I'm going to get excited. I'm just going to yell like, squirrel! And I'm going to go running towards, I don't know, somewhere else. And I'm going to paint something that makes absolutely no sense. But that's how I am. So I'm sorry. I apologize. That's what you're going to get. So that was it for this week. Uh, Next week, new theme. I'm going to try to connect it. Because I had this thing just uh, revolving in my brain uh, with something that we did, not this week, not the shadow week, but the past week with the colors that we use randomly. Because there were some colors that I used that I was like, these are good. You know, I should spend some more time with them. So you guys will see what we're going to do for next week. I hope to see you there as we always do on Fridays. Danny and I thank you. We really, really thank you for everything for you guys taking your time to view this uh, video thank you if you are downloading the images that we upload for you in all of the videos descriptions those are yours you can print them you can do anything you want with them thank you if you are able to buy our paintings i always tell people don't buy a painting just because it seems like it's a good investment and because they are cheap no just buy it because you feel like you know, it'll be good company or just buy it because you really like what we're doing and you want to support what we're doing and you feel kinship with the uh, philosophy that we have that is kind of fueling all these um, efforts and these videos and these paintings. Um, And we hope to see you next week. New theme. Danny and I, thank you. We love you. Bye.